I remember the first day at university, we were at this big lecture hall, all of us international students, and there was a welcome lecture. The person giving it said, you're going to fall in love with this city. In about two years or so, you're going to fall out of love with it and start being a little unhappy, maybe a little bit homesick. But eventually you'll reach a point, a sort of in-between, that's going to be normal and you'll just lead a normal life here. Well, <laughs> let's just say that that last part never happened with me in Stockholm. Free education, especially a free master's, that was the main pull of going to Sweden. In my case, though, it was a bit more than that. I have what I thought was an interesting cultural connection to Sweden. For example, I had been admiring Stockholm's own, Ingmar Bergman, for years, falling in love with the frosty, almost mythical language his actors spoke. Vem är du? Jag är döden. Kommer du för att hämta mig? Jag har redan länge gått vid din sida. Det vet jag. Är du beredd? Min kropp är rädd. Inte jag själv. I decided to apply for a master's in human-computer interaction and was accepted by KTH. I was going to Stockholm. Living there, however, was not. If I had to describe Sweden in general, at least as I experienced it, I would say it's a culture of agreement. What I mean by that, it's very much groupthink. It's group over individual. Uh, you shouldn't stand out too much. There's actually a very interesting Protestant ethic, even though the country itself is officially atheist. I think it's permeated their culture and you can actually see that every day. Like I remember walking down in the streets of Stockholm and all I would hear would be words like bra, which means well or good. Jo visst, aha, exactly, absolute, absolutely, exact, exactly. And all you would hear would be agreement. There would be no friendly arguments or anything animated. It would just be, uh-huh, mm-hmm, oh, mm, bra. 
absolut. And strangely, I found that that extended to the workplace. I was at this meeting and we were sitting across this really long and narrow meeting table. And I forget what the topic of discussion was exactly at that moment, but I disagreed with someone and I thought I would voice my opinion since I thought I was actually contributing something to the meeting. But when I did, everybody audibly gasped. <gasps> How dare I? Even though Swedes mostly kept to themselves, I had begun feeling the hostility against who I was and where I came from. This colleague and I were sitting at the cafeteria of the university, that is, and we were just having a nice discussion over our lunch. And this guy, this random Swede, uh, whom I had only encountered maybe once or twice in a lecture or something before, comes up to me and he starts harassing me about the fact that I'm Greek. He starts calling me, well, not exactly names, but saying, oh, you Greeks, what have you done to our economy and how dare you and so and so and what are you doing here and what do you think is going to happen with you know all the crap that your country did and all I could think of first of all was to tell him look I'm not the prime minister of Greece you might want to lodge your complaints elsewhere and this was back in 2009 when the crisis was really fresh so I eventually got him to shut up and basically leave us alone but he was very aggressive and that was one of the first times that I actually felt very unwelcome and very foreign, very other. Even some of my colleagues mistreated me. One of them, in fact, engaged in casual xenophobia at my expense. He would find any chance he got to just insert little jokes about my ethnicity here and there, like if he gave me an assignment, he would say, hey, make sure you don't get lazy, because you are a Greek after all. Or if I told him that, okay, I will have this ready in two days instead of one because I needed to rest a little bit, he'd say, oh, what, are you going to have a siesta, like your fellow Greeks and Mediterraneans? Stuff like that made me once more feel like I wasn't part of the group, I wasn't actually acclimating. And... Even though I would have told someone else about this off, I kept my mouth shut and my only reaction was simply not to laugh because I was not amused. On top of it all, I began having financial difficulties. I needed a job but had no luck finding one. Thankfully, I was able to get a teaching assistant job at Stockholm University, which back then shared the building with KTH. I was a master's student teaching master's students. I was probably the youngest TA around, so I felt quite honored. The money was barely enough for survival, but it worked for me. The housing situation, however, was one of the most horrible parts of my experience in Sweden. I never felt like I could settle down because I didn't really have an actual place I could call my own. I couldn't afford any decent apartment, let alone nice ones, so I had to illegally rent rooms that people sublet. Perhaps somewhat strangely, one of the best situations for me was the time I lived in what I can only call a bunker out in a snowy field. Yes, it was barely a building, but at least I was alone and I even had a decent kitchenette. Sadly, this one came with an expiration date, as it was normally meant for Erasmus students. I could not rent indefinitely. As if that wasn't enough, I was told by the university my TA contract would not be renewed. They had no more hours for me. No more hours meant no more money. No more money meant no room or apartment to live in. It was time to go back home.
Eventually, I finished my degree, defended my thesis online from Athens, and received my diploma. About half a year later, after many applications and a lot of searching, I got an offer for a PhD position at Stockholm University. Off to Stockholm I went, once more. Everyone deserves a second chance, right? It wasn't long after I came back that I had my second xenophobic shock. One day I was just heading out, going from my room towards the university just to start working on something. And I thought, okay, let's just get some coffee, the usual. I went to one of the two chains I usually went to. And I come in, I'm greeted by this smiling barista who was visibly not natively Swedish. She had very dark skin. Why does that matter? Well, you'll see in a second. She was very polite in the beginning. She asked me in Swedish, hey, what would you like? And I said in English, hi, I'd like a latte. She smiled back at me. She said, oh, I really love your accent. Are you from Canada? And I said, you know, you've got a good ear because my teacher is actually Canadian and that's where I got my accent from. But no, I'm actually not Canadian myself. She smiled even more widely and said, oh, so where are you from? I said, I'm Greek. Her face soured and hung at the same time. She turned around, averted her gaze from me, looked down and said, oh, so you're here to take our money then because your country is poor. <laughs> In that instance, I was so just overwhelmed with all the ideas for jokes or comebacks that I come up with, because there she was, a daughter, visibly a daughter of immigrants, telling me off for going to another country to work and study. Well, she didn't know what I did, but still. So in that instance, I just went with something, let's say classy. I just said, look, it's not my job to educate the ignorant, so please just make me my coffee. Thankfully, I didn't have to go through all of this on my own. My wife and I met online. I actually um, submitted this piece I had composed for piano, but wasn't able to play myself because it, it was a little too complex for my skill at the time. And I asked, hey, is there anyone on this Facebook group that can play this for me? So Meredith responded, and then somewhat of a romance bloomed out of that. Uh, we met in Stockholm, and we spent two fantastic weeks together. And from that, we knew we wanted to be together. During those two weeks, though, she actually got to experience with me, and I'm very glad that I have a witness for all this, because sometimes it seems surreal, some of the xenophobia and racism that's going on that nobody really talks about. Meredith and I got quite a few dirty looks from Swedes uh, because we actually look very different to one another. I am quite visibly Greek, even though I'm not too dark, and she has very blue eyes, very fair skin, and back then she had bright blonde hair. So people actually mistook her for a Swede, and they didn't like the fact that we were together, I guess. They give us dirty looks. I ignored it because it was a survival mechanism for me. I just thought, hey, what can I do about it? But Meredith actually got in their faces and she would say, hey, what are you looking at? Do you have a problem? And Sweet would just, you know, get all tight and say, okay, no, no, no it's nothing. And just scurry away. They hate confrontations, so that's just what they do. They very rarely say what they think. The next incident we experienced together is still the most shocking one for me. We were just walking down the road normally. We weren't bothering anyone or yelling or whatever. We were just having a quiet conversation amongst the two of us and holding hands. And this family passes us by, mother, father, and their little blonde child, their little boy. And as they were passing by us, the boy turns around and points at me very visibly and just in my face and happily screams or at least shouts, Mama, Mama, Svatskale, Svatskale. 
and svatskale in Swedish means blackhead, which is a term used for people who basically are not blonde. We're not even talking about dark skin necessarily. Just anybody who has dark hair might be Mediterranean, might be Middle Eastern or anything else can be a blackhead. That's a very racist and derogatory term. So the family, of course, was mortified and they just shuffled away and told the baby to shush, but he heard it somewhere, right? Due to the isolation, the coldness I experienced from most Swedes and this general feeling of not belonging, I decided I couldn't stay in Stockholm anymore. I had met and fallen in love with Meredith and I wanted to live with her and marry her. We both preferred Greece over Sweden, or even Texas, where she spent most of her years. I had seen and learned a lot, but it was time to go home. For good. We were at this uh, PhD meeting and it was about the time I had decided I'd go away and had actually talked to my supervisors about leaving. And I thought I'd announce it. I didn't really have many friends amongst the PhD students because I was very solitary from the get-go. But we gathered around, we were having some coffee and I just said, hey guys, I'm." just wanted to say goodbye, hope to maybe see you again one day because I'm going to Athens. And this person came up to me, she said, hey, wait, you, you work here? And I said, yeah, I've been working here for three years. She said, I, I've literally never seen you. I've worked here for three years as well and I haven't seen you once around the corridors. Like, what are you? A ghost? I had a friend who used to tease me anytime I'd come back from Stockholm on vacation, whether it was Christmas or summer. He would say, yeah, yeah, come back. Come back so you can see why you left. But sometimes the opposite is true. Go away so you can see why you were here in the first place. <laughs> 